Thank you. Uh, today I'd like to look into a scripture that we've probably read many times and heard, or heard many times, but I want to read it and then just break it down so that we get it in a little bit of context and a bit of culture around it so that we may be able to understand it a little bit better and maybe our relationship with Jesus will, will also be come through a little bit better. It's, co it's coming from Luke chapter 2, and I'm starting at verse 22. If you've got a Bible, please, or a device. It used to be just a Bible, now it's a device. If you've got a Bible or a device, or if you're watching this um, at home, you're looking Luke chapter 2, and I'm starting at verse 22. When the time of their purifica purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The him, of course, is baby Jesus. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. So let, let me put this in context and we'll stop here. We're going to read on to verse 32, but not just yet. Let me break. I want to break this down because we've got to understand this. And we've got to understand who we are and where we are in Christ Jesus and what the whole purpose of the plan of God was, because if we don't know what the plan of God was, we will be in confusion. And the Bible says that God is not the author of confusion. So here we've got this here. It's telling us now that Joseph and Mary are going to the temple after 40 days, and there they're going to, she's going to complete her purification process, and, and Jesus is going to be dedicated to the Lord. Now, the reason she's doing this is because the Bible tells us in Leviticus chapter 12 that a woman gives birth, a Jewish woman gives birth to a male child and through natural means, then if that happens, then she's got to be, she will be unclean for her normal cycle period of, of being unclean for seven days and thereafter for a further 33 days. That's why they waited 40 days to go to the temple. Jesus at this time would have been circumcised after eight days. So here we see the circumcision, which is the recognition of the covenant that God has with the Israelites being performed. We must remember that Jesus was born into a Jewish family. He was raised as a Jew. His parents were proper Jewish, biblical Judaism, which is a bit different from rabbinical Judaism of today. But they were following the law of Moses and going to the temple. And when they got there, they had to sacrifice, they said, the Bible tells us, a pair of doves. So it's two doves or two pigeons. Now, the, where we find this in the scripture, uh, also Leviticus chapter 12, it says there that the sacrifice will be according to your means. In other words, what you can afford is what you will sacrifice. So it says you can actually sacrifice a bull if you're very well off, or you sacrifice a sheep or a goat, and it comes all the way down. It's like a welfare system. It comes all the way down to the, the poorest of the poor. All they can sacrifice is two pigeons that you find in the street but you don't find them in the street. You actually buy them. They've got, they've got a place where you just go and buy them. So they would have sacrificed those two pigeons, which gives you a little bit of an insight into the wealth of, of Mary and Joseph at that time. So uh, some of us are thinking, and I, you know, wow, but what happened to all the gold and the, the, the silver and the mare and you know, all this stuff that they were given by the three wise men? It wouldn't have happened yet. This would have been before that. So they go along, they follow the Jewish law, and they, they go f and they finish it. Then when they do the sacrifice, the priest will sacrifice the doves, and Mary will, he will, she will then get a blessing, and she will be officially clean. Now, when they say clean, that doesn't mean that she was dirty. It's just ceremonially unclean, which means she was not allowed to attend. Let's just say she wouldn't be allowed to attend church for 40 days until she became clean. So now she was able to do that, and that was great. Now, we come to this. The second part, and the second part is where Jesus is going to be dedicated. Now, the rule there is in Exodus chapter, chapter 13. And we find there that God has said that every first male has to be de dedicated to the Lord. Now, we wonder, well, why is that? Why is it the firstborn and the males have to be dedicated to the Lord? And it goes all the way back to Egypt when they were coming out at Passover time, when Moses was taking the children of Israel out of Egypt. God said to Pharaoh, he said, said to, to um, uh, Moses, first of all, tell Pharaoh to say that Israel is my firstborn. 
Israel is his firstborn. Wow. Let him go so that he may worship me. So that Israel was the firstborn. Now, this comes in conjunction with them. We start to go right back. Let's just think about this one. Now we've got Jesus coming up, and what's going to happen? He's going to be dedicated as the firstborn. We'll see how this happens, because when you go right back, Adam was the firstborn. Adam was the one who was supposed to have dominion and rule over the earth with Jesus Christ. Uh, the Lord, well, Jesus Christ, uh, he was always there because the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. So they was, he was going to rule, but he didn't. He, he was usurped by the evil one. So then, after a period of time, God finds a man called Abraham. Abraham, God pays a visit. Let's just say he pays a visit into the Gentile world, because there were no Hebrews at that time. There were no Israelites. He pays a visit into the Gentile world, and he finds a man called Abraham. Abraham was a descendant of Shem. Shem's father was Noah. So Abraham is chosen. Abraham obeys, and because of his obedience, God says in Genesis chapter 12, I will bless you, I will make your name great, and I will bless your, your nation, your seed, and all the nations of the world will be blessed through you. We know that. That's, that's, that's great. The firstborn was important. So the mantle from, from ruling and uh, having dominion over the earth and sp being out and, and spreading the word of God and teaching the, the word of God was taken from Adam and it was given to Israel. Israel is my firstborn. It was done there. And Israel, they failed in it. They failed in it drastically. It just didn't happen. They weren't doing it. They were, they were, they were uh, just talking amongst themselves. They weren't doing anything about it. Adam failed, Israel failed, and the firstborn system seemed to be a total failure. Because when Moses went up the mountain to get the commandments, when he came down, they were worshiping a bull calf. So in this, 3,000 people were killed. God then said, we're taking it from the firstborn, and we're going to, instead of it going to be a nation of priests, a nation of people who are going to spread my word, I'm going to now just choose one tribe, one tribe called Levi. That tribe will be the, the, the tribe of priests. They will be the ones that serve me. And they were. they were. They were picked and they stepped forward to a man, and they then had to serve the Lord in the tabernacle of Moses. When God gave Moses the description, we've seen the tabernacle before, all the dimensions, it was a pattern of what was in heaven, and everything was done, everything was there, everything was, was, had to be done exactly to how God's standards was. But after a period of time, there was a problem, because what do you do with your firstborn? Because the firstborn now have been redeemed, because during the last plague, all the firstborn of the Egyptians were killed because when Pharaoh would not let them go, the last plague was the firstborn of the Egyptians killed. The, the Israelites, they went inside and they put the, the blood of the lamb on their doorposts and they were saved. So what do you do with the firstborn? They are supposed to be the, the, they're supposed to be the priests. Well, they failed. And they had to now be dedicated, and that's why we get Jesus being brought into the temple, because Jesus had to be redeemed. Can you believe it? He had to be redeemed from God, because the firstborn owed God their lives, because they were spared. Their job then was to spread the word of God. That didn't happen. So every, the tribe of Levi now has, has got that job, albeit temporarily, by the way. So Jesus then had to be taken to the temple. Every firstborn male. What the cost was five shekels. It was a symbolic offering, and it was all to do with symbolism. So the firstborn, five shekels would be given to the priest. The priest would hold the five shekels out. He would ask the father, he would have said to Joseph, do you want the five shekels or do you want the child? I know what some of you are thinking. <laughs> he said, I want the, the child. 
then the priest would symbolically take the five shekels and they would go into the offering of, of, the, of the temple. And then the child was, was uh, that was the redemption. This would happen in the temple, by the way. This would be happen, only happen in the temple in Jerusalem. It had to happen there. So Jesus then was redeemed. Isn't it amazing? Even as a baby, he was associated with sinners. And when he was on earth, he was associated with sinners. When he was a baby, he was classified as sin. And when he was older, he was talking with the sinners and mixing with the sinners. And he was, he was in a bad place, according to the people. So the five shekels was right, but God always retained ownership. So that was always just a temporary thing. Now, back in biblical history, King David, we, we heard about him this morning in the Psalms, but King David, he would, he would come into his own because he went to, to, to rescue the Ark of the Covenant that had been stolen. And he went to the Philistines and he went with a whole troop of Levites because they had to bring the Ark of the Covenant back again. So when the Levites were coming back, they were all dressed as priests in their white linen. And what was David dressed like? He was dressed in white linen as well, but he wore an ephod, which only the high priest was able to wear. And he wasn't of the priesthood, but he acted as a priest. David was a type of Jesus. David was a king. He was a prophet because of the prophecies in the Psalms. And he was acting like a priest. He brought the Ark of the Covenant back. And you know what he did? Guess what? He made a tent. He made a tent, a temporary dwelling called a tabernacle. We have the tabernacle of David. We have often, often heard about the tabernacle of Moses, but we have never really spoken about the tabernacle of David. So what was the tabernacle of David like? Well, the tabernacle of David was different to the tabernacle of Moses because there was more freedom in it. The tabernacle was a, they had a tent, they had the Ark of the Covenant, which represents, by the way, the presence of God. The Shekinah glory was in that, and it was there, it was in the tent. The veil, there was no veil. And the Bible tells us in Chronicles that, wow, you know what? There was singing and dancing and joy and worship and praise and prayer continually with the Israelites and the Gentiles in front of the Ark of the Covenant with no separation of a veil. Now, well, we didn't know that. No, no, but, but that's what it was like. Do you know what God said? He said, before I come back again, in other words, before Jesus comes back onto the earth, he said, I will restore the tabernacle of David where there will be no veil and where we will worship God in spirit and in truth. Remember Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman at the well? He says, you people worship on Mount Gezerim. We worship on, on uh, Mount Zion. He says, the day is coming. He was talking about the tabernacle of David spiritually being renewed with the new birth that is going to be in his believers. Now we're back to the temple. And as we stand in the temple, we were into the birth of Jesus. So the early tabernacle, it was only a tent, a, t a temporary dwelling place. And now we see that the temporary dwelling place of God is in the flesh of man. This flesh, our flesh, is a temporary dwelling place for God in us. Jesus was born in mankind. So what makes him, he, that was, it makes him to become a descendant of Adam. So Paul talks about him as the last Adam. In other words, Adam was the beginning of creation and the plan was there for Adam to have dominion, rule with God. Now we have got the last Adam. Now it's important to know it's not the last Adam. I've heard some people say the second Adam. He's not the second Adam. You don't refer to him as the second Adam because when you say a second Adam, you think, well, there might be a third one or a fourth one. No, this is the last one. Jesus is the last hope of this earth, of us. So Jesus is the last Adam. He is the descendant of Adam, now the new creation, and he is going to rule over this earth. And he's going to rule with, uh, over the earth. Now, I did speak about the Levites. They, they took the actual job of having the mantle of being a light unto the Gentiles from the Adam. Then it came to the firstborn, and then it came to, to the Levites. But you know what? They failed as well. So it was taken away from them. 
and we see it getting being restored again. Now let's have a look at, at Matthew 25. I'm just continuing from where I left off. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Consolation of Israel, what does that mean? It, means, it really means the comfort of Israel or the deliverance of Israel or Israel being at peace. You've got to understand that Israel was on complete dominion of, by the Roman army. They were slaves. So they wanted, to get, they wanted to have peace. They were looking for a Messiah. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Notice it wasn't in him. It was upon him. The Holy Spirit came in at Pentecost, into the believers, into you and into me. At Pentecost is what first happened when the church was created. The Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed. That's what the Spirit does. It gives you a revelation that had been re revealed by the Holy Spirit that he would not die. This man, Simeon, an old man, would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ, the Messiah. God moved by the, you know, this is beautiful. God, he moved by the Spirit. He went into the temple courts. Simeon went into the temple courts. He must have been looking. He had been going into the Torah. The Bible says he was a devout man. He was in the temple probably every day. He was probably looking for the Messiah every day. The Spirit must have quickened his spirit. Do you know sometimes when people say to you, how do you know that you're saved? And you say, well, it's just I know. Can you prove it? No, you can't. I just know because I know because I know. Do you ever slip off the track? Yes, I do, but I'm, I know I'm still saved because I know because I know because I know. When you tell that to some people who don't understand, they just shake their head. Well, he was moved by the Spirit, and when the parents brought the child to, to, do, uh, to do for him what the custom of the law required, in other words, to get the, do the five shekel thing, <clears throat> Simeon took him in his arms. He lifted Jesus up in his arms, took him in his arms, and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. So he takes the Messiah in his arms. He looks at Jesus. He was looking for Jesus. He is now looking at Jesus. And now that I've seen him, you may let me die in peace. When we look at Jesus, when we get the revelation of who Jesus Christ is, we can die in peace. We die knowing we, where we are going. We do not die in ignorance. We die knowing where we're going. He says, for my eyes have seen your salvation. That's a revelation. That's what we, each of us, got from the beginning when we got saved, when we believe, when we follow. There's times when you don't think like it because there are times where in the total human spirit, the flesh takes over. But the Spirit of God lives in you. And that's what's important. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the sight of all people. Everybody in the temple must have gathered around because they've all known Simeon. They believe Simeon was the, the, the son of a, a rabbi, a, a very famous rabbi called Hillel. That's another story. He says, you will be a light for revelation to the Gentiles. And you can only get saved when you get an epiphany of God and who Jesus is and what he's done for you. And then the revelation comes into your heart and it, makes you, it quickens your spirit and you feel, wow, I've just had like an adrenaline burst. It's great. And for the glory to your people, Israel. So a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory for your people of Israel. Now, okay, so... What we're looking at here is uh, uh, Simeon's not just sort of sucking this out of the air. He's not making this up as he goes along. He's not just saying, you know, you're going to be alive for the Gentiles and didn't know that. He's quoting from Isaiah 42, verse 6, and it says, If the Lord had called uh, you in righteousness, I will take hold of your hand. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. This is repeated in Isaiah 49. I will take you by the hand. I will make you a light to the Gentiles. A covenant for all people. Paul and Barnabas, in the book of Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas, they were in uh, Antioch. And the, the early Jewish uh, believers in Christ 
the, the, what we would call today Messianic Jews, they, they actually were allowed to go into the synagogues and minister. And the lay preachers, that was a thing in uh, the early synagogues where lay preachers could come in and they could actually minister um, to, to the congregation. And they were ministering to the congregation in Antioch, which is in southern Syria, uh, southern uh, Turkey today, Asia Minor then. And they, were, they, they, they give the message now, we have, we've been sent as a light to the, to the nations because they were Israelites. The, Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin. They were Israelites, so they were also carrying that mantle. They were carrying that message. We were carrying it. He said, we've, we've brought it to the Jews, but the Jews have rejected it. He says, and now we're giving it to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are receiving it, and they've also got the glory. They've got the revelation of God. They're also going to be saved. The Bible then goes on in uh, Acts chapter 13 to say, and you know what the Gentiles did? They were rejoicing because of it. The Jews weren't looking too happy about it, but they, they were rejoicing. And you know what? We have always been in God's plan. And it's not an afterthought. It's not, well, the Jews rejected Jesus. Who else can we get? We'll go to the Irish. So he did. No, well, no, you, you, know, you know what I mean? So he said, I will also make your life for the Gentiles. And then he goes on, that you may bring my salvation where? to the ends of the earth. Remember Jesus when he gave the great commission out to the disciples? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the rest of the world. He's fulfilling that. Now that, that, that like, I took a, a, a task with sort of with running with this, with this torch. It was given to believers because Jesus said that to the believers, he said to his disciples, he says, you, you, or the light of the earth. Now, th this is not for self-preservation, and this is the thing we've got to realize. It's not, well, I'm okay, Jack. I'm on the boat. No, no, we've got to help others to get into that boat. We've got to be that light to shine, to spread the gospel message to God, of God to other people. It's, it's, it's so interesting when you, when, you, when you dig into it and you know, see, the Gentiles, they, they never, ever had a relationship. They didn't have a covenant with God. God always made a covenant with the Jews because God chose them. They were chosen. Now, we often hear, who's the chosen people? The Jews. Yes, but do you ever ask, what were they chosen for? They weren't chosen because they were better. They weren't chosen because they were more wealthy. They weren't chosen because they were more devout. They were chosen to do a purpose. And that purpose was to give the word of God out. And they were given, the Bible tells us, the oracles of God. They had the Torah. They had all the word of God. But they had to re read it, translate it, decipher it, and spread that message out to everyone. And they didn't do it. Gentiles never had a covenant with God. But we are always in God's plan, and we still are. Today, we are still in God's plan. We're, he, he still knows about us. Isaiah 49, verse 6. This is how I know it's so great, because Jesus came. He says, I've come for the lost sheep of Israel. That's what he said when he was on the earth. But his, his, his plan, his ultimate plan, was, was the whole nations all over the earth. God said, it is too small a thing. In other words, the task, this task I'm about to mention is too small. It's a too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob. In other words, to restore the 12 tribes of Israel. That's too small. And bring back those of Israel I have kept. That is too small for you to do. So what I'm going to do, I will also make you a light for the Gentiles. Back in Isaiah's time, long before that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. Wow. That is so, so good. That's so exciting. You know, when we, uh, we look and we see an illustration of various things, we, we look at uh, the, the Olympics is coming up in, later this year in, in Japan. And they've got a torch, the Olympic torch. It gets lit or lighted, lit. It gets set on fire in Olympia in Greece. And then they run with it 
they run with so much, then they relay, they pass it on, they pass it on, they pass it on, till they come to the, the stadium where the Olympics is going to be held um, in the world today. And then they light a huge cauldron with that same torch, and that cauldron keeps burning the whole time the games are on. And that's the flame that's been put into us. Now, we've got to understand that, first of all, we're not an afterthought. Um, Paul himself says in Ephesians 2, verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier of the dividing wall. In other words, the chosen people who was to give the light to the world, they failed in that mission. Now we have got Jesus, and he's now passing on that light to who? To the people who believe in him, his believers. They have now got that. They are now the light of the world. The Jews, the early church was all Jewish people. They were Jewish people who believed in the Jewish law. And they were the people who believed in the Jewish law, but they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. Most of the people looking for the Messiah to come think he was going to come and reign as a kingdom on the earth and conquer the Romans. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. It's of a higher place. And he was talking on a spiritual level. So we have to then, Jesus says, I'm giving this. Paul says that that dividing wall between Jew and Gentile was broken down. That dividing wall between male and female is broken down. That dividing wall between groups and denominations, that dividing wall between black and white, that dividing wall between different people with different orientations, that dividing wall has been broken down all through the faith in Christ Jesus. There was a story in back in the 1800s, and they give this altar call, and they made the uh, they said that you know you ha when you had joined the church back in those days a traditional church they the, the church congregation voted whether the people would be they would vote whether the person coming forward could be a member or not of the church and there was a, a very well known prostitute at that time and she was touched by the spirit of God and she came forward and gave her heart to the Lord and was in tears and then she asked if she could be a member of the church. And as soon as she said, could she be a member of the church, the whole church went silent. Nobody said a word. Eventually a man, his name was Samuel Colgate, very famous man. He stood up and he said, he was a part of the church uh, oversight. He says, I guess we blundered when we prayed that the Lord would save sinners. We forgot to specify what kind of sinners are acceptable to us? So in Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. The relay of the Olympic torch, wow. All that running and then eventually it's burning the whole time. You see, the thing is, boats, boats are built not to be anchored in a harbor, Cars are, are built not just to be sitting in your driveways or your garage for 24-7. And disciples are built not to keep what they have had, the revelation of God to themselves. We've got to share it. We've got to give testimony and share it out to the other. There's a group of, um, a group of young people were discussing salt. What did Jesus mean? Because later on that, that, that passage, he was, the Bible says, you are the salt of the earth. <clears throat> What does it mean? One, one answer was, well, salt improves flavor. Yeah, it does. It actually does. Sometimes it needs a bit of salt. Okay? Salt improves flavor. Second thing is that salt is a preservative. So salt improves flavor. Salt is a preservative. I remember growing up back in, the, in, the, in Belfast, we couldn't afford a fridge. Um, but Living in, in Ireland, most of the time, you didn't really need one. You know, uh, you'd need one maybe for a couple of months of the year. <laughs> the rest of the time, it's fine. Leave the milk outside. The only thing worried you then was the birds would come and take it. But <clears throat> it was cold enough. But I remember when we first got our fridge. But before we got our fridge, and it was a little small, one of these small fridges. Before we got the fridge, my mom used to preserve the fish in salt. She used to salt it and keep it. And that's how she preserved it. So salt improves flavor, and salt is a preservative. The other thing, though, and I find this interesting, salt 
makes you thirsty. We're the salt of the earth. And I thought, have I ever made someone thirsty enough for the Lord Jesus? Have I ever made someone want to drink from the river or from the wells of living water? Shouldn't we want to enable everyone to want to perceive this world that we're living in with a new vision given by God through the revelation of Jesus Christ? So the priesthood passed from the firstborn of Adam to the firstborn nation of Israel to the tribe of Levi. From the tribe of Levi, it then transferred to the firstborn of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He is the firstborn. Paul talks about him. He is the first fruits, the firstborn of all creation. And because we are in him, we become the firstborn. In him. In him, not in us, whether you're Jew, Gentile, rich or poor, male or female, it makes no difference. In Christ Jesus, we become the firstborn. And we then take on that mantle of spreading God's word out. May God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his, lift his face up and make his face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you all the peace in your heart. I just want to finish by saying I just know that, that, that God is living within you. The Spirit is there. And it doesn't matter why, whether you feel up or whether you feel down. Just know that. And when you know that, you will be back on track. Thank you. God bless.